So this presentation comes from Zavili in Spain. Um, Dr. Cordelas, this disclosure is no personal will. Uh, they ha he has a few for the Institute. So the presentation is built up uh, in five topics, rationale, types and results, critical overview, patient selection and conclusions. So the rationale for giving maintenance therapy. So what we all know is that if we treat patients with chemotherapy, usually a platinum doublet, then around 75 of the 100 will obtain clinical benefit, being either a CR, a PR, or stable disease. And then we stop treatment, watch and wait every two to three months. We do a, a checkup. And during that period, patients may deteriorate pretty fast and then getting in too worse situation, too bad to go for second line treatment. So in daily practice of the 75 who finish the first line treatment, about 50% will receive second line therapy. All the other ones are not fit enough apparently to go for that. So this is the traditional approach. So you start with chemotherapy, four to six cycles, then you have a break, and then you have second or third line therapy. What maintenance therapy is meant to do is you have the first period with induction in the same way, and then go for maintenance, and then wait, and then you might go for additional treatment as well, which is not per se meant to be the blue treatment as shown here, could be something else as well. So the rationale is it is effective, it delays disease progression, it is usually well tolerated, it, is, it has no uh, life-threatening adverse events, it still allows patients to recover from the previous chemotherapy, it shouldn't have a negative impact on the quality of life, and it should allow patients to live their life as normal as possible. So there are several ways you can give maintenance therapy. And in these slides, these types of possibilities are shown. So you can either continue the therapy you started or you continue the ma continuation maintenance, which means continuation of the non-platinum drug in the first line doublet. For instance, if you start with cisplatin or carboplatin gemcitabine, you give gemcitabine, or for the non squames you do that with pemetraxid. You can also switch maintenance, which is you have used two drugs in the first line combination, and then for the maintenance, you use a completely different drug. For instance, allotinib. And you can do targeted maintenance, which means you have a specific target for which you give a specific drug, such as bevacizumab or cetuximab or nesitumumab. So first on continuation, which is in fact prolonging your chemotherapy. So there are a few old studies who address this question. This is comparing three versus six cycles of very old-fashioned chemotherapy, mitomycin, vinblastin, and cisplatinum. And what you see here, overall survival is not really different. And symptom control seems to be a bit better if you do uh, six cycles instead of three cycles. But the median period is exactly the same. So not very convincing for prolonged chemotherapy. This is a US-based trial in which paclitaxel and carboplatin at an AUC of six and 200, which is a sufficient dose to say Either give four cycles or four cycles and then continue with the same drugs. And what you see here is the median is a bit better for the continuation, but at one year there's not much difference, and this did not st reach statistical difference and has not been translated in prolonged chemotherapy. So moving to the targeted maintenance, so there is a triplet 
giving from the beginning and then continuation with the targeted agent. For instance, the ECOG 4599 study published by Alan Sandler, sorry, in the New England Journal in 2006, so this is the registration study for bevacizumab, in which it was shown that the combination of three was better than the combination of two. So adding bevacizumab to the standard chemotherapy was better than the other one. And in that trial, it was, bevacizumab was given prolonged. So after the chemotherapy being um, carboplatin paclitaxel was stopped, bevacizumab was continued. And the same for the FLEX trial, published by Robert Pucker in 2009. You see six cycles of chemotherapy together with cetuximab, and then cetuximab continues. So that translates in this curve. And in fact, the curves are completely superimposable till the point where the chemotherapy is stopped and then cetuximab is continued. So get the impression of this, at least that's my reading of this slide, that cetuximab adds something to it, but it only adds it during the maintenance phase. And there's another one with nesitumumab, also continuation of nesitumumab, and here the curve split earlier. But all this is not a real trial design for assessing whether maintenance has, is useful. So it is just the way the trial was set up. It's the triple in the combination in the beginning, and one of the triple is continued whereas in the other arm, all therapies stopped. So that doesn't prove that maintenance is really worthwhile. It's just a way to give it. So then the switch maintenance, well, this is in fact the first way uh, in which we try to prove something. So one of the first trials uh, which was presented, I think, I think in 2007 at ESCO, might have been 2006 by uh, Fidias, in which he did something that had never been done before. So he gave gem carbo, and then he randomized the patients to two groups, either giving them immediately docetaxel or give them at progression docetaxel. And what you see is that there's a difference in the curves um, for P of S, as a nice hazard ratio and a p-value. For overall survival, the p-value is nice, but it's not significant. So there's still some uh, crossing over at level one. So there is a benefit for overall survival, but the p-value is not significant. But as such, a very interesting approach. And this was more or less done in a comparable study but much larger, with pemetrexid versus placebo as the maintenance bar, so the switch maintenance, randomization two versus one, so the number of patients receiving pemetrexid was double. And what you see there is that there is a nice difference between the PFS of the, in favor of the treated patients versus the placebo or control and that also translates in overall survival benefit, 13.4 versus 10.6 months. And if you break it down to the non squamous histology, which we didn't know in those days that pemetrexid was really a drug mainly for non squamous but if you do that, and it has been done, then the difference is even more significant. So very nice p-value, very nice acidosis 0.44, and also for survival, a hazard ratio of 0.7. Then the, I think this is the Saturn trial, in which patients, a really a large group of chemo-naive, non-small cell patients, received chemotherapy, and the non-progressors were randomized to receive either Tassiva or Elotinib, 150 mix per day, or placebo, till progressive disease. 
And what we see is that there is a slight benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.71 for PFS and a slight benefit in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.81. So medians of 12 versus 11 months. So then continuation maintenance. So this is a study with gemcitabine. It's a rather small study. It's also randomized two to one. So it is 138 versus 68. The induction regimen is cisplatin and gemcitabine, and then either continuation with gemcitabine or best supportive care. And what you see as a difference in PFS with an hazard ratio of 0.69. Sorry, one back. And no difference, at least not significant, in overall survival. But a rather small trial. So this is another study published by Maurice Perrault. This is a French study, uh, which is as design, very nice, but not very large numbers in the arms. So start with cisgem and then gemcitabine, elotinib, or observation. And what the study shows is that there is a difference in PFS of gemcitabine versus observation, hazard ratio 0.55, and the same but a less favorable hazard ratio for elotinib, 0.82 but also significant. So PFS, that endpoint, um, has been uh, achieved. So there's a difference. Then a very large study with 900 patients planned uh, with as induction in non-squamous, non-small cell, pemetraxid cisplatinum, four cycles, followed by either pemetraxid or placebo, and both, of course, the best supportive care as well. And the primary endpoint of the study was PFS, whereas other endpoints were overall survival, quality of life, and things like that. So what we see here, this is a hazard ratio of 0.62 for the primary endpoint, so PFS. Overall survival, hazard ratio 0.78, and a significant p-value as well. So, to look at all these studies in a little bit more critical way, so what you see, the, the majority show a, a nice value for PFS, but only the minority, being here, has a difference in overall survival, which is what you want to achieve. And then, breaking it all down, and I'm not sure whether I understood the meaning of this slide well, but what you see here, if you combine it all, it, it favors maintenance for overall survival as well as it does for progression-free survival. So if you combine all the studies together, so there is a rather strong support for uh, maintenance therapy in this situation. I'll skip this one. So there might be a critical thing on that. So the induction was only four cycles. Would six cycles have been as good as maintenance. Now look at the, the Paramount data. So that had four cycles and then maintenance, whereas another Eli Lilly study had six cycles as first line. And then looking at a number of things like toxicity, which has, this has more toxicity, but does that, so this is not a head-to-head -head comparison. This is comparison of two different trials and curves taken from the, the trials. If you look at this, this is the maintenance, so that is the, the solid red line, whereas the control arm, which is the placebo arm in the Paramount study, is the blocked blue line. And from another study, that is six cycles of induction treatment these curves are more or less superimposable, which is more or less the same for overall survival. So 
The argument saying that six cycles instead of four would have done the same as, as maintenance, it's at least not supported by comparing these data. Then another thing could be, that is there any difference in post-treatment, so after progression, after um, the maintenance therapy or at the induction uh, after, uh, after placebo, so at progression. So there's not a real difference. And also the, the switch is quite, sorry, the switch is quite high to the maintenance drug as well. So that does not support the argument that the switch to another treatment after progression would explain the overall survival benefit. Well, then, looking at toxicity, because that's another thing uh, that is important, if you look at pemetraxid versus placebo, this is the Paramount study, there is certainly there's some, somewhat more toxicity in the pemetraxid arm, which is shown here, versus the placebo arm, but overall, there is not that much grade three and four toxicity. So the most important thing is anemia and fatigue and then neutropenia. So it's really bone marrow effects. Looking at costs, it is a little bit more expensive. Uh, if you look at maintenance, it had more cycles than when you gave second line although the number of cycles is only four with pemotraxid versus five in the other group. So it's not that much different probably looking at costs measured in the way that the number of cycles are translated in dollars or euros or whatever. So then the quality of life of the maintenance drug I think there is a box, no, there's no box. So, allotinib gives a better pain control, pemotraxid, better pain and hemoptysis control, and here in this continuation, it had no detrimental effect. So, quality of life apparently seems to be either maintained, or it has not been reported, or it is a little bit better for some aspects. So then the patient selection, so looking at this, this is the Bellani study in which uh, gemcitabine was given with, as maintenance. So there's no difference here uh, favoring gemcitabine. Looking at the JMEN trial, which was the initial trial looking at pemetrexid versus placebo in all comers, there you can see that if you break down the data into squamous versus non-squamous, here you have squamous. There's no difference in favor uh, of pemetraxid. In fact, it's the other way around. Placebo is a little bit better than uh, pemetraxid so with a hazard ratio of above one. Whereas the non-squamous, they really benefit, 0.7, with a nice B value. So that supports that you have to select patients based on some characteristics, and in this study it was the characteristic histology. Then in the Saturn trial, there was no information when the patients were recruited about the mutation status of these patients. And part of the positive effect is really due to the mutated cases, although the numbers in which it was done is not very high, Known, known 22 uh, versus 27, but these curves are very far apart. So allotinib versus placebo in this group is very much in favor of giving allotinib. But on the other hand, this distracts a little bit from the message from the Saturn study, in which it was demonstrated that it was overall a better treatment, which I'm not so certain um, has translated in uh, uh, extensive use in daily practice. Okay, skip this one. So, in conclusion, 
Maintenance therapy offers the possibility of continued active treatment to delay disease progression and improve survival. There are some pros and cons, as always, of maintenance therapy, switch and continuation. And you need to discuss it with your patients, of course. There are more studies needed to do, in particular those evaluating tumor-tailored uh, strategies, optimizing the patient selection and treatment specificity. I think that's the last. Let's skip these ones. Okay, thank you for your attention.